Okay, so this was the first measurement technique. And last time we discussed about all these coupling techniques. So there is capacitive coupling, inductive coupling, galvanic coupling. And you also figured out that it would make sense to measure the near electric or near magnetic field directly at the surface of an IC package or at the surface of an IC pin. Yeah, and the same idea had some engineers a long time ago, more than 20 years. They also thought that, ah, oh, we can characterize the electromagnetic emission of an IC when we are placing a an H field probe, so a magnetic field probe, directly at the top of the IC package. And the first technical draft of this, in this case, IC61967-3 surface scan method standard was really looking more or less like this. So they had a very big probe. The first draft, the probe was not round, it was rectangular. And it exactly had the same size as the diagonal of the IC package. You are holding this rectangular probe. So if this is the IC, you're holding it directly in the center of the IC package, and then you're turning this probe in 360 degrees around the IC. And then you can also characterize something about the near magnetic field that is present at the surface of the IC package or maybe propagating out of the IC package. Later on, they came to the idea that oh, it would be much better to use a very small probe and not place the probe in the center, but maybe move the probe along the whole package to get a little bit more feeling where is more like magnetic field and where is less magnetic field. And yeah, the standard also gives some recommendations how to build such probes. There was a recommendation how to build an electric field probe. Electric field probe in this case is very simple. There is a in this case, semi-rigid coaxial cable, and the inner wire is the, just standing out a little bit of the shield, so you have to remove the shield a little bit and to have the inner wire standing out a little bit. And this is then a very, very simple electric field probe. And for a magnetic field probe, the inner wire is just rounded around one time, three times, maybe more to increase the inductance, and then solder it directly to the shield of the coaxial cable. So this is a very, very simple way to build a magnetic field probe. Here and I think 20 years ago, a little more, I also used this idea and built a magnetic field probe. So here it, you can see the coil of my magnetic field probe. It has a diameter of about roughly one millimeter. And then we started making the first investigations by measuring the near field at the surface of an IC package. Okay, the way how these near fields are generated was already discussed. So we have currents flowing inside of the chip. So there are magnetic fields coupling out of the small loops, of mainly of the IC package, bond wires and lead frame. And inside of the chip, or especially due to the bond wires and the lead frame, there are also metal structures and we can build a capacitive coupling out of the metal structures. So since many years, there are also commercially available probes. Oh, no. Commercially available probes available. <laughs> probes available that can be bought from uh, mentors, for example, like this company Langer, EMV Technik in Germany. They made also some very small H and E field probes. They are more or less the size of a pencil. Also how we can do. And this was then the first measurement setup that we built at AMS because we had a customer which was somehow or who was complaining about the electromagnetic emission of a product. And my job was to figure out where does this electromagnetic emission come from. So I thought, okay, yeah, lose, use this surface scanning and scan the package area to see how much near field we have and especially where the near field is generated. So we used an Stepper motors, X, Y, and Z, to move the probe step by step along the whole package of the IC. So we started somewhere here and moved the probe top, 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 and so on along the whole package. So it took quite a long time because at every frequency position, or sorry, at every X, Y, Z position, we have to measure the whole frequency, the whole electromagnetic emission, and the standard recommends 
to measure at each frequency position with your EMI receiver at least three times the operation cycle of your IC. Well, which makes sense because um, suppose you have a microcontroller, the microcontroller is in 99% of the time in sleep mode and just wakes up when something is happening, then it captures some information and provides this information and falls back into sleep mode. And if most of the time the microcontroller is in sleep mode and you are scanning, you will not measure that much electromagnetic emission. So therefore you have to wait at each, each position at least three times as long as the microcontroller takes to get out of the sleep mode and get back into sleep mode again. And then it depends also on the frequency range. The standard says measure from 150 kilohertz to one gigahertz, even higher. And yeah, usually you have to measure with a certain resolution bandwidth. We will come to that um, anyway, especially then in the labs. So you are with the EMI receiver remaining at the frequency position with a certain resolution bandwidth. This is a kind of Gaussian shaped bandwidth and you have to remain there for at least three times. And then you're moving to the next frequency position and the next frequency position should not be that far away because then you're missing some frequency locations. So you're only able or allowed to shift to the next frequency half the bandwidth so that there is an overlap of the two measurements then you're shifting again half the bandwidth, have to wait, shift again, shift again. Depending on the frequency range, you have 11,000 or even more frequency points to measure. So you can imagine that on each X, Y, Z position, you have to remain three times the operation cycle and measure 11,000 frequency positions and then move the probe to another position and there are maybe, whatever, 20,000 positions. So it takes a little bit until the measurement is there. But this was then the first measurement we got, and we were pretty surprised because oh, you can really see in a nice color-coded way how big is this near-field coupling, how big is the magnetic field directly at the surface of an IC. You can see some red hotspots here and here and here and here, and red means a oh, lot of electromagnetic emission, or in this case, a lot of magnetic field, and blue means not that much electric field, or magnetic field. Yeah, and then we were talking to the designer and we were asking, hey, what's the pinning here and what's the pinning there and what is this pin here? And then it was pretty clear where the emission is coming from. There are the clock pins. where We are providing an external clock signal from an oscillator and there are the data IOs. Okay, so the first time we got some color-coded nice information where this emission is coming from. You can also represent it in a 3D representation and so on. So this was more than 20 years ago. Yeah, well, I think it was a very nice way to highlight the sources of EMC problems directly on the package. But the designers were not so super happy because they really wanted to know where on the IC level this emission is generated. Well, from the outputs, it's clear it must be somehow related to the output drivers. But sometimes you also have electromagnetic emission that cannot be directly related to one of the pins. And then you want to know which circuitry inside of the microchip is responsible for this electromagnetic emission. And therefore, I was using a micro manipulator. So this thing here, it's basically a microscope. And usually it's used to characterize microchips on the wafer level. So you can place a wafer directly here on this chuck. So it's a, just a plate where the wafer is soaked in by a vacuum, or soaked on it by a vacuum. And then with micro manipulators, so small needles, you can then probe metal parts on the wafer. So these are the probes, the probe holders, and there are then the needles. So here you can see one. And yeah, I used one of these old fashioned micro manipulators. Actually, my boss wanted to throw it away because it was very old already during this time when I used it. And I said, ah, we need a new one and our wafers are much bigger so we cannot use the old ones anymore. And they said, no, ah, please give me this old micro manipulator. I need it for a surface scanning system. And I want to build um, with stepper or with DC motors a control system where I can control the probing of this needle in the X, Y, and Z direction. 
And actually, my boss was not super happy with this idea because he said, ah, it's a waste of time. We do not need this thing and a crazy idea. And then, yeah, mainly my spare time over the weekends, I was building this thing. I was writing quite a lot of from lab view programs in order to control the motors and control the EMI receiver and set everything. So it took a little bit of time. But this was then the first result that we got. So we were also able to find somebody who, were, who was able to make a very, very, very small H-field probe. Because <laughs> the one millimeter probe diameter that you have seen before is much too big to make really good resolution pictures at a very small scale, so in the nanometers range. So we were asking the father of our lab uh, technician, he was a watchmaker, if he's able to make a very small probe, so free wires, or free windings of a gold bond wire. And he was really able to make a very small loop with free windings. It has a diameter of about 150 micrometers. And he was then soldering this very small loop at the tip of a semi-rigid coaxial cable. And this was then the probe that we have used to make these nice pictures. And it was also related to a problem from the customer. So the customer was complaining that, ah, the electromagnetic emission at 336 megahertz is too big because my system is violating the FCC rules. Or also at 332 megahertz, the electromagnetic emission is too high. And our designers were very frustrated because for them it was very difficult to figure out where this electromagnetic emission inside of the chip is coming from. And then we started our first scans. We were scanning exactly at this frequency, so not all over the frequency range, just at this frequency where we have a problem. And you can see the near field, the near H field distribution at this frequency. And then you can immediately see, ah, there is a red hotspot, or in this case it's a white hotspot here. And yeah, okay, there are two pins, so it was then not that complicated to go to the design and say, hey, these two pins, especially the drivers here, they are responsible for the electromagnetic emission. And at 332 megahertz, we had a red hotspot again here, but also one here directly somewhere in the middle of the digital part. And finding a problem in within the digital part, I hope you can imagine, is very complicated because <laughs> you're not placing each component of the digital part by hand. You're writing usually a VHDL file and then figuring out which component in my VHDL file is responsible for the electromagnetic emission is a little bit tricky. But with this information, it was not that complicated because we were going to the layouter and told the layouter, hey, check, there must be something here which is responsible for the generation of quite a lot of magnetic fields. So please take a look in your layout what's here. And then we were checking the layout and it was not that complicated finding it because in the digital part, there are usually rows. There is VDD and VSS and between the rows, there are all the digital components like inverters and NOR or whatever case. And unfortunately here in this area, the extraction tool which was extracting the clock tree. And the clock tree extraction tool is usually uh, extracting the clock tree in a way that it's generating a lot of clock buffers to further amplify the clock signal so that the clock can be distributed all over the chip in the same way, as synchronous as possible. So it's not just here at the oscillator pin so that there is a, um, an oscillator with a big clock driver, which is then driving the whole clock into the microchip. So, okay, there is a clock driver, but it's distributing the clock signal to different areas, and there are additional buffers to amplify the clock signal and to provide it. But unfortunately, the extraction tool, or the place and route tool, was placing quite a lot of these X20 buffers, so of the biggest buffers, in a close proximity. In one row, I think there were three of these buffers next to each other. And this, this clock buffer is nothing else as a CMOS inverter. And remember, we talked about CMOS inverters. They are producing crowbar currents and dynamic switching currents. And now imagine there are more CMOS inverters supplied by the same supply, switching at the same time, generating quite a lot of 
current to do the shot through the totem pole current. And this was really the problem there. Yeah, the redesign was pretty simple. Because, uh, okay, we had to make a whole redesign because it's not that easy just to <laughs> remove one of these clock buffers. But uh, the redesign step was not that complicated because we were telling the extraction tool, uh, don't use an X20 buffer anymore because they had <laughs> the biggest one, use smaller ones. And the extraction tool was then also forced to more evenly distribute the smaller buffers. And then this problem was gone. So in the end, this was a very, very powerful tool to analyze the sources of the electromagnetic emission, really where these things are coming from. And after showing these pictures and showing then the redesign and that we were really able to solve the problem and help the customer, my boss was then convinced. And yeah, a little bit later, I left the company. And the most important thing for my boss was <laughs> telling my... <laughs> Uh, substitute, hey, you need to learn how to handle this surface scan system because this is the most important system that we have. <laughs> so in the beginning, sometimes it's a little bit complicated to convince your bosses of a certain idea. And then if you're leaving the company, this is the most important thing that should be transferred. Okay. Yeah, so this is how the system looked like. Or actually, this is the system that we have now built at our institute. So we have more or less the same micro manipulator, and we're also using a control PC to operate the movement. In this case, not the probe is moved, the IC on the chuck or on this table here is moved. We are keeping the probe fixed and we are moving the IC. And we are using a spectrum analyzer or an EMI receiver. And yeah, we also have a very, very small probe. So we can characterize in the frequency range most probably up to six gigahertz, and the resolution is 0 0.6 micrometers, so roughly in this direction. So we can really make very, very accurate movements and have a very high resolution. Okay. Um, yeah, what else can be done? I can also zoom in then to one XYZ location and take a look what is really the electromagnetic emission over whole frequency range over there. So there are many nice features that can be done. Also this one, I think this was a nice project from a bachelor student, more or less a software engineer student uh, who was working at our institute and uh, yeah, more or less by accident I was showing him the surface scan system and I told him that, hey, it would be cool to have a kind of virtual reality uh, software tool so that we can really highlight these magnetic fields at the surface of a system or of, of an IC. And he was then programming over the weekend a very nice software. And I hope my link is working. Where you can directly see with augmented reality tools how the in this case, near magnetic field at the surface of a whole printed circuit board looks like. And you can also slide the frequency and see how this magnetic field is changing over the frequency. Unfortunately, this is not done in real time, so there is not really a real <laughs> magnetic field probe camera <laughs> which is capturing the <laughs> magnetic field in real time. So this is what the people thought at the first time when they saw this video that, oh, we have now a... <laughs> smartphone camera which is capturing magnetic fields in real time. But we're working on that, but <laughs> maybe in the future we will have something like this. Okay, yeah, there are then quite a lot of pictures that we have taken. So I was, my last months at AMS, I spent quite a lot of time in the lab and doing all this surface scanning measurements. Okay, so measuring the near fields, near electric, near magnetic fields directly at the surface of an IC package or microchip.